said, uh, I'm going to turn things over to, to Soam, let him take it away and, and cover uh, serverless vision and also talk about kind of where Nats and Kubernetes fit into what they're doing. So let me take you off mute, Soam, and let me make you the presenter. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the intro, Brian. Um, and thanks for having me on this uh, on the webinar. Um, and thanks for joining, folks. Uh, so uh, I wanted to talk a bit about serverless in general on Kubernetes um, and about Fission um, and how NATS uh, is a really important part of that story. So, uh, so I'm going to just dive into what uh, what Fission does on Kubernetes and then talk about uh, how, how NATS is part of that story. So um, just a minute. All right. Okay, that's better. Okay, so uh, so Fission functions are are basically um, similar to any other functions as a service uh, setup, such as AWS Lambda, except that you can run them on any Kubernetes cluster on your infrastructure, on clouds, anywhere. Uh, and what it 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 does uh, it does two important things. One is that if you have a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, it's not always trivial to figure out how to stand up a service on it. So uh, going from code to a service in uh, that's actually usable, exposed to the world, getting requests and serving it and operating that um, is a non-trivial amount of work even after you have Kubernetes. So we wanted to make that really, really simple with Fission. And, uh, and so what we do is you can write a snippet of code and you can uh, Call that a function, and you can assign that some kind of trigger, such as HTTP or things from message queues and uh, or events from message queues, and we can start those functions on demand. Uh, and there's a lot more detail here uh, about how we optimize the startup latency of these functions. Uh, we keep pools of containers that are ready and waiting for connections uh, that are already listening, so that. Uh, when a request actually comes in, we don't need to pull any images or create pods and so on. All that work is already done. Uh, and then when the request comes in, all we have to do is load a, uh, a small function. Uh, so we have cold start latencies on the order of uh, tens to hundreds of milliseconds, uh, depending on the size of your function and uh, the language environment being used. And we have a large set of languages supported. Um, all of the common uh, sort of serverless uh, languages use Node.js, Python, Ruby, we even support Go, uh, and there's also a build pipeline for functions for languages like Go. Um, and again, there's a, there's a lot more detail here. Uh, go to fission.io or join our Slack, and I'll, I'll be talking about uh, some of, I'll be sharing these links in the future. Uh, but I want to dive into some of the event-driven stuff in particular. So, um, so Fission's integration with NATS is uh, pretty simple. Uh, we, you, you can invoke Fission functions using HTTP, and that gives you simple synchronous invocations. Uh, but if for any reason that invocation fails, uh, then that request fails. So it's a simple mapping of uh, one request to one invocation. Uh, any failures are sent straight back to the client. Uh, now, if you want an asynchronous request, um, then you also have to ask, uh, how reliable that request is. If I if I send a request but don't wait for the response, uh, now it becomes important for the system to be able to recover from failures and uh, have some kind of durable way to, to persist that request and retry uh, if there's a infrastructure failure or code failure and so on. Uh, so in, we investigated various message queues and we wanted something that fits well into, into you know, Vaguely speaking, this cloud-native world. We wanted something easy to deploy, uh, easy to run, and uh, that's relatively simple for a for a new user to to understand. And uh, NATs, and in particular NAT streaming, fit that bill really well. So you can deploy it on Kubernetes. I believe there's a Helm chart. It's either ready or it's coming, uh, but it's included in the Fission all install. And uh, so out of the box with uh, with the full Fission install, you get a NAT streaming installation on Kubernetes. And, uh, and Fission allows you to bind functions to, uh, to queues in NATs. Uh, 
they're called queues in this picture, but I believe the NATS terminology is channels. Um, so various queues call this channels, topics, um, subjects, and so on. Uh, but NATS lets you um, uh, create multiple channels, obviously, on uh, on a given installation of NATS streaming. And you can map a function to events from a particular channel. And so every time there's uh, an event on that channel, there's uh, a subscriber within the Fission infrastructure. It pulls out that event from the channel and it invokes the function, giving it the payload of the event. Uh, and on the other side, as the function completes, that response is sent onto another response topic. Now this binding between the topic, uh, sorry, the channel and the function is called a trigger. And so Fission supports message queue trigger uh, of type NAT streaming. Uh, and I'm going to quickly dive into a demo of that uh, before we go into some more complex setups uh, of using Fission and NATS together. So let me just hop into my uh, terminal here. Um, I'm going to skip over the actual install of Fission. Uh, it's installed using Helm, which is the Kubernetes installer. I already have the Fission all chart here. Uh, there's also a Fission core chart, which is more minimal and designed more for um, uh, towards like customizable setups, uh, but Fission all gives you uh, Fission and NATs and various other little utilities. Uh, there's also workflows, which we'll talk about in a second. Okay, so, so we have here a, a, a hello world function uh, installed on this cluster, and I can just show you what that function is. It's simply, uh, it's in Node.js and it uh, simply returns a response hello world, uh, ignoring the actual request body. And then we have a binding of this function to the NATS, uh, to a couple of NATS topics, sorry, channels again. Uh, and that that message queue trigger is called NATS demo. And if you, if you see here, it maps to the function name hello. Uh, the message queue type is NAT streaming. Uh, uh, this is the, the NATS webinar, so I didn't go into this in detail, but NAT streaming is a durable version of NATS. It supports uh, actual persistence of events so that if you crash and recover, uh, your, your events are still there in the queue. Uh, and the function is mapped to the demo.request topic and responses are mapped to the demo.response topic. So what we're going to do is, first of all, you uh, you can just, um, oops. So first of all, you can just hit that hello world function using curl and um, you can see its response is hello world. So we invoked hello world using HTTP. Uh, now let's go back to invoking it using NAT, uh, invoking it asynchronously. Uh, so we have a little uh, NATS client here. We're actually using the, the example client from the NATS streaming repo. Uh, and we're sending a, uh, an empty event into the demo.request uh, channel or topic. And that's going to just run, uh, we, we won't actually see any response from the function. It simply pushes an event onto the queue. So this is asynchronous. And that streaming has gone and saved that event. Fission has noticed that event, invoked the function, and pushed the response onto a response queue. So now let's see if that response has made it onto the response queue. And we should see a hello world here. Let's see if that works. All right. So. What happened in there is uh, the hello world function ran. Um, now I should show you the actual Kubernetes cluster to see where this function occurred. So uh, functions run in the fission function namespace on Kubernetes. And we can look for the hello uh, function pod and, and we can look for its logs. And you can see that it was invoked uh, with a post request uh, from the uh, from the fission infrastructure itself, uh, and you can see the fission pods that subscribe to the the NAT queue over here, uh, and we can 
look at its logs to see what it actually did with that event. So ah, we don't actually log per event because that would be expensive, but you can see here that it's subscribing to the NATS uh, uh, streaming message queue. Okay, so that's a really simple demo uh, for, uh, for one function and requests and responses. Now, what can we do with this kind of uh, setup? Uh, you, can, you can chain these things together to make fairly complex uh, setups. So you can have, uh, for example, you can have a pipeline of data transformations. You can have, um, you can have other services that uh, throw events into the queue. For example, Minio is an example of a storage system that you can run on your own infrastructure that, uh, that you can watch for changes to, uh, changes to a set of objects. And if there's a new object or a deleted or a modified object, it can emit an event into the queue. And you can have functions that then operate on data in that storage system based on these events. Uh, and you can chain them together. You can have, uh, um, for example, you, can, you could have an image resizer that involves some sort of caching. You can have multiple functions. Uh, maybe a first function checks uh, for a cache response. And if so, sends a response to, uh, to a queue. Uh, and you can have a function that demultiplexes events and sends them to multiple queues and so on. Uh, and you can also have a, uh, you can have both scatter and gather patterns. You can collect responses uh, into one queue from multiple functions and have one function that's invoked from each of those queues. Um, so uh, all of these uh, setups are, are certainly possible. Uh, but you may notice that, that as, you, as you increase the complexity of this kind of setup, it becomes operationally pretty difficult. Uh, for multiple reasons. One is that you don't really see a big picture of the, the, there is in a sense a workflow being created here and you don't necessarily see the whole picture of that workflow as you're, um, as you're operating it. Uh, because in any given cluster, there may be lots of functions and different queues being used. Um, and it's not easy to tell which functions are related to each other without, uh, sort of examining every trigger binding and looking for common uh, topics between responses and requests of different functions. So there's a sort of implicit compatibility constraint being developed here when you create such a, such a system. Uh, and even though it's really powerful to, to develop things with this system, uh, it's fairly hard to operate. So um, given these implicit compatibility constraints and, uh, and the difficulty of seeing the big picture, uh, it's, for example, pretty hard to upgrade. Uh, when do you can you can you upgrade such a system confidently, knowing that uh, no uh, no requests would be disrupted? Um, how would you test such a system? How would you test uh, one change to a function uh, in a system? And um, finally, there's also no notion of how long a total um, uh, amount of time take is taken for a certain workflow. Uh, you, you have to piece that together from uh, tracing data uh, and you would have to create that tracing data by yourself by manually sort of passing around tracing IDs. Uh, so, the, so going back to this picture, the development story is really powerful here, but the operational story is somewhat lacking. Uh, so we looked at this system and, and we figured we need some sort of uh, higher level managed event-driven system if you're going to create complex workflows. Uh, and there are multiple, many different ways to attack this problem. Uh, but we chose to start with uh, a, a, a system whereby you, you create some sort of workflow of, uh, let's say, multiple functions. And they have control and data flow dependencies between each other. So let me just hop into an example here. So here's a really simple example with two functions. You um, this this workflow actually maps uh, joins together two uh, sort of silly, trivial command line things. Uh, one is a command fortune, which outputs a random quotation, um, and the other is whale say, which uh, which can take an arbitrary piece of text and uh, make a little ASCII art cartoon whale with that text uh, in a in a in a speech bubble. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to send the output from this fortune quote into that whale say, uh, so that we'll have um, a wise little ASCII art whale uh, 
um, making these these silly codes. Um, and what you can see here is that there are two tasks in the workflow. There is a dependency from the, the second task to the first one. That dependency in the requires block is a control flow dependency. So it means that the fortune must run before the, the whale task. Uh, there's also a data flow dependency. So you can see the input of the whale's hit task uh, depends on the output of the generate fortune task. So, um, so control and data flow dependencies are separated. In this case, both dependencies are, are the same arrow from one task to another. Uh, but in general, you can have more complex things. You can have parallelism and uh, if statements and, and we'll get to a more complex workflow in a second. But uh, let me just run this little workflow. And let's go back to our demo here. So um, once again, I've already created the The, the workflow here. So these are two functions and this one's called fortune. Um, so there are two little uh, functions. They are actually written in bash because uh, Fission supports uh, uh, bash as well as a, uh, as a function language. It's really useful for kind of automation, devops -y kind of use cases where you don't necessarily want uh, to write code in, in Python or Go. Um, and uh, let's look at the actual workflow. So that one is called fortune whale. And um, this workflow is actually uh, stored internally as JSON. Uh, this YAML is, uh, the YAML that you see here is converted to this JSON. Um, it's, uh, uh, we can we can get to the documentation to see how how exactly that conversion works, but um, essentially the the YAML is is the same as the the JSON in, in expressive power. So uh, now we can simply invoke that um, that workflow, and uh, we'll we should see a whale with some sort of text. Uh, in a speech bubble uh, and it's actually random so you keep it uh, so, you, so you get a, a, a random set of quotes from an ASCII art whale um, so that's that's the simple demo of workflows um, I want to I want to get into a little more uh, complex dependencies in a second um, but uh, but before that, I'm going to talk about how Workflows works internally, how it uses NATs and uh, Kubernetes and Fission, and how it how it ties these things together. So uh, Workflows, uh, the Workflow engine is a uh, is a Fission environment. So uh, Fission has environments that are basically the the language specific part of a function. Uh, for example, there's a Node.js, there's a Python, there's a Ruby environment. Uh, and if you think about it, this this little YAML is a is a language that uh, that a user can use to create a function. Uh, so the workflow itself is just a just a fission function that happens to invoke other fission functions. Uh, and so the workflows are an environment uh, where you upload uh, to fission that kind of function. Uh, and when you invoke it, the workflow uses NAT streaming to to manage the uh, each uh, event in the workflow. And uh, the, the way we do this is that every occurrence of a task in the workflow, so the beginning and end of a task, the inputs and outputs of the task, uh, they are sent to NAT streaming as events. And this stream of events forms the, the invocation state of the workflow. So, so when we invoke that, uh, so when we invoke this whale with fortune workflow, um, we uh, we send uh, an event into the into the NAT streaming message queue saying this uh, workflow has begun. Uh, the workflow engine uh, uses a pattern called event sourcing to to manage the execution of workflows. Uh, 
event sourcing is the idea of managing state using a sequence of events that change that state. So, uh, so for example, the workflow engine needs to keep state such as this workflow is invoked, uh, so-and-so tasks have completed, so-and-so tasks have not yet completed, uh, or we're waiting for this or for that. And so, uh, so the workflow engine dumps an event into the queue and the event sourcing part of the workflow engine notices that event and uh, actually invokes uh, the first set of tasks that it needs to invoke. So the workflow engine internally has a scheduler here uh, and that scheduler looks at your graph of dependencies and figures out what the next thing is to invoke. Uh, in the case of the start of a workflow, it invokes anything, it invokes all tasks that have uh, no dependencies. So in, in our case here, that was the fortune task. Uh, and it invokes that by uh, calling back into fission and invoking that fission function. Uh, when that fission function completes, uh, another event is sent back into the NAT streaming message queue saying, hey, uh, the fortune function has completed. Uh, and the workflow engine controller notices that event and uh, then goes back to the scheduler and says, okay, this task has completed. Uh, what tasks are now uh, are now ready to invoke given that some more dependencies have been satisfied? The, the output of the function is also stored in the queue and, uh, uh, and is available for use to, to any other function that wants to, uh, that wants to use the output of that function. Uh, so this is a, this is just a high level overview of the workflow architecture. Uh, there's more detail in the workflow repo, which I'll point to in a second. And you can also ask me questions at the end of this. Uh, and I'd like to show you a, dip, uh, a demo of how we how we do dependencies in the workflow engine. So, um, so here's a really simple workflow YAML. It, it does absolutely no useful work at all, but each task sleeps for a few seconds. And then we have, so task A sleeps for 10 seconds and has no dependencies. Task B sleeps for five seconds, but requires A to have completed before it. Task C sleeps a little bit and requires B. And then these three tasks are all dependent on task C and they each sleep for a slightly different amount of time. And then there's two more tasks. Um, so task E depends on three different tasks. So you can see the gather pattern working here. Uh, and finally, the final task depends on that that last task. So um, let's try running this workflow and monitoring the status of this workflow as it runs. Um, so again, uh, this workflow is already created as a function, I believe. Um, So this is the sleep a lot uh, uh, workflow again that YAML is translated to JSON internally, and we can just um, we can just invoke that function. Uh, before I hit enter on that invocation, I'm going to switch to another part of my terminal and show you how we can uh, how we can monitor the status of workflow invocations. So Fission Workflows comes with a, a workflow CLI. This will eventually be integrated into the, the Fission CLI itself, uh, but it lets, you, uh, it lets you introspect deeply into the workflow engine state. And uh, in this case, we're looking at workflow invocations and we're getting a list of invocations. So these are just the invocations that occurred in the last, last few minutes of this demo. And uh, they're all invocations that have completed. So let's start a new one. And we should see one that's in progress here. Great. And, and let's, let's watch the status of that thing. Okay, so, uh, so let me go back to, to this. And you can see here that uh, make this big enough. So you can see here that tasks A, B, and C have completed and that triggered tasks D1, D2, and D3 to start. Uh, and you can see these complete. And as soon as the third one completes, E will start. Um, so it's still sleeping. And then 
E is starting, F is scheduled, but is not in progress yet. And once E finishes and F finishes, uh, then the workflow invocation itself will complete and that succeeded. Um, so this was just a bunch of sleeps, but it shows you uh, the patterns in which you can use dependencies. Uh, this, this idea of using dependency graphs lets you create fairly powerful control flows. So you can have um, parallelism by means of uh, by means of tasks that all depend on the same task, and so they'll all be invoked in parallel. Um, you can also have dynamic tasks uh, within the workflow engine, uh, and you can do that to you can use those to create things like if statements or loops. I'll show you that in a second, um, and you can also use tasks like this one, which gather together a set of uh, uh, tasks that have been invoked in parallel. So you can uh, you can imagine the typical map reduce pattern here. Uh, you can invoke a function on a, on a large set of data, and you can have a gather pattern that then depends on all of the functions that were invoked, and you can do some kind of reduce in this function. Okay, so let's go back to our before I before I hop into questions, uh, I'm not going to actually run this workflow, but um, here's a demo of a slightly more involved uh, workflow, and and this is more of a, a business process automation kind of use case. Uh, so here we talk to an API, we get the current weather at a certain um, at a certain location. Uh, so I actually forgot to talk about the inputs of workflows. The uh, each task is allowed to specify an input and it can either refer to the invocation itself um, and this is the the workflows the workflow functions input or it can refer to other tasks output or in general it can refer to any combination of these um, using uh, using some other notation you can actually specify a full JavaScript expression here uh, and that's interpreted you, in the workflow engine itself. And you can do uh, little transforms of data using JavaScript in this input uh, in line itself. So that avoids the overhead of calling a function if you just want to do a simple data transformation. So uh, what this workflow does, it calls, uh, it calls an API. Um, it, uh, uh, it converts that to Celsius. Uh, uh, it converts temperature that's outputted by that API to Celsius, and it runs this if statement on that. So, uh, so if is an example of a dynamic task, uh, which simply means a task that uh, operates on other tasks, kind of like higher order functions in uh, in functional languages, if you're familiar with those. Uh, so, in this case, the if statement operates on uh, the data from another task, uh, and it has a then part, which uh, which if the temperature is higher than a certain number, post the Slack message. And uh, if, the, the, uh, if the temperature isn't higher, it does not post the message. And similarly, at the end, it creates a result. Um, and so you can see this visualization that uh, of these tasks, the, uh, uh, sorry, the tasks are created, um, the tasks are visualized as, uh, as boxes and, uh, uh, if statements in a in a flowchart, the visualizer is uh, is something that we'll be adding to the Fission uh, UI. Uh, but for now, you uh, you can use the YAML and the JSON to uh, to specify workflows. Uh, but in the future, you'll be able to to drag and drop these boxes and add dependencies as well. So um, uh, this example, by the way, is in the Fission uh, workflows repo. You can check it out. Uh, it's a little simplified for for showing in in the in the UI here, uh, but you can look at the full example in the repo. Um, so here are some links. The fission.io is our website. Um, this is a fully open source project uh, under the Apache license. Uh, it's created by Platform Nine, and uh, it's on GitHub at fission github.com/fission and fission workflows. Um, and we have a Slack. We're available for any questions. Uh, if you're watching the recording, especially, drop by the Slack, ask us any questions you might have, or tweet at us, or um, on fission.io, on fission.io, actually. Uh, 
Um, so let me go back to the webinar and see if there are any questions. Um, does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? Yeah. So um, and and thanks. So I appreciate the uh, appreciate the overview and especially the demo. I know I know people like to like to see demos and actually see this stuff running. Um, so I see several several questions. I'm just going to kind of take them in the order they came in. Um, so the first question is just kind of general about the space. Someone was asking. There's quite a few serverless platforms around in the market at the moment. Uh, yeah. what, what separates OpenFaz in particular? Oh, I haven't studied that one in enough detail, but um, so maybe I shouldn't talk about them <laughs> too much. But uh, as far as I know, uh, you know, speaking generally, not too many of these uh, implementations have any kind of um, cold start optimization. So we actually create a pool of uh, containers. Let me point at a slightly older blog, if I can find it. Um, here it is. Uh, this blog is from way at the beginning of the year, uh, but it shows uh, how it, it talks in detail about how Fission creates a pool of containers uh, that let you bring your invocation, your cold start latency down to a few milliseconds. So that's, that's one. Uh, the other thing is Fission actually operates at the level of source code. Uh, um, and this is a fairly uh, uh, opinionated thing. Uh, this allows you to write just source code and not have to actually go through the pipeline of creating a container. Uh, Fission actually includes a build pipeline. So if you have, let's say, a Python function and it has a requirements.txt, uh, then Fission has a builder. It will fetch your, all of your dependencies. It will create a zip file, store it internally, uh, and it will be able to invoke that function. Now, again, specifically, uh, I don't know which of the other serverless things uh, do these and which don't. Uh, but as far as I know, uh, Fission's uh, <laughs> one of the few that uh, that does all of these things. It has a wide set of language support, a wide set of triggers supported, um, and actually includes more of the build pipeline and does fast code starts. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm not sure that answers the whole question, but. Um, you know, someone who's not me should uh, do a more impartial uh, comparison of uh, the serverless space. Um, uh, someone who's unaffiliated with each of the projects, uh, right. and that would be, I think, uh, a more interesting thing for users. Yep. No, that's helpful. That's helpful. Um, thanks. So, next question was related to scale. I mean, I saw a few people asking essentially the same question in different ways, but yep. the, the crux of it is. Uh, you know how how well does this scale, and in particular when you when you're handling you know thousands of parallel tasks, for example. So, is the question for workflows or for fission? Um, let me try to answer both. Um, so let's talk about the core workflows first. Uh, fission made a made a conscious decision to to live on top of Kubernetes and to use Kubernetes for for all of the the underlying execution and scheduling stuff. So Fission's own scheduling is really, really trivial. It just invokes a part on the cluster. And the Kubernetes scheduler is what gets to make the far more complex decisions of where on the cluster this part should run, how much resources are available where. Uh, in terms of routing, again, Fission uses uh, Kubernetes to do routing to different function parts. Um, there's uh, there's an ongoing effort on the Fission core side to, to actually auto scale functions better. Um, right now we're uh, at, at the beginning in Fission we were very focused on cold start latency but not enough on throughput. Uh, so we're we're fixing that and in, in over the next uh, two releases which which should occur in uh, over the next couple of months. Uh, we're focusing on the throughput of functions as well. Uh, so there's auto scaling and better scheduling of requests into parts um, and keeping track of the request rate that each function part can accept. Uh, but again, even there, we'd be using Kubernetes primitives such as deployment services and the Kubernetes horizontal part auto scaler. Um, so Fission's job really is to pass on your requirements to the Kubernetes cluster and the, the real smartness of how to operate the cluster lies inside Kubernetes. So, so that's on the Fission core side. On the Fission workflows, the story is a little more complex because uh, 
uh, even though Kubernetes obviously has really smart schedulers, uh, it, it may not make sense to invoke a, a vast number of functions uh, and push them all and schedule them all at the same time on Kubernetes. So uh, the workflows language is very powerful in that it allows dynamic tasks. Uh, these tasks are actually Go plugins to the workflow engine, and you can you can use those to do you can use those to control, for example, the amount of parallelism in a in a given um, in a given dynamic task. So uh, so the the workflow engine comes with a simple map uh, a dynamic task, which will let you let's say invoke a function on every element of a list. Uh, but you could also customize that to say limit the, num the amount of parallelism. Um, and uh, since that's just uh, Go code that you'd be writing, you could even do smart things there, such as uh, keep track of the, the actual resources that are available and schedule more uh, smartly, figure out how many things need to, uh, need to be invoked in parallel, depending on the requirements of the function and the availability of resources in the cluster. Uh, so the, the 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 system allows fairly powerful uh, functions to be created. Uh, workflows is very early in its uh, in its maturity, so it doesn't support some of these things out of the box. But uh, as we as we go into the beta release of workflows, which uh, which should be sometime uh, first or second quarter next year. Uh, you'll be seeing a lot more of these things out of the box. So, uh, so then you will reach a point where you can have a better uh, control over the parallelism of tasks uh, in in case of big data use cases and so on, without actually writing custom functions. You can do that today by writing custom functions, but we'll get to a point where you don't have to. Okay. Thanks, so helpful. Um, uh, the Follow-up question there was about ingress and egress. Uh, someone was asking, can you ingress and egress from other systems uh, you know, into and out of Fission, and, and how does that work? Yes, so uh, certainly. Uh, there's So ingress is a, a bit of a larger topic, but there's a few. Uh, I'll go from the simple towards the more complex setups. The simplest ingress setup is to take the Fission router and create a Kubernetes ingress resource and expose your router to the outside world using Kubernetes ingress and you can have any Kubernetes ingress controller such as, as um, something supported by your hosted cloud or something like traffic which is fairly powerful uh, and that you know if that ingress controller could be the place where you terminate uh, SSL uh, where you have a little extra metrics you can even have authorization and uh, authentication and authorization in some of these ingress controllers so, so that's the sort of simple uh, use case. Uh, there's more fine-grained uh, ingress possible. You can create function-specific ingresses, which then map to certain routes on the router. Uh, and finally, you can create Kubernetes services that map to uh, that map to Fission functions. Um, and we're do doing some work in Fission where, where those services can be created automatically, and you can map uh, individual functions to ingress as well. So that covers uh, you know, exposing functions to the outside world. Uh, there's a whole uh, larger topic of uh, security within the cluster, and uh, I'm actually currently working on uh, Fission integration with Istio, uh, which will give you things like mutual TLS, rate limiting, all that stuff within the cluster uh, using the Envoy sidecars inside functions. Um, and again, Istio has its own ingress and egress uh, support, uh, which will let you control uh, TLS um, in a more systematic way. Uh, so, so that's ongoing. Uh, today, the answers to ingress tend to be pretty simple. Uh, just create an ingress and point it at the Fission router. Uh, and create uh, routes that you want to expose to the outside world. Excellent, thanks. Uh, so one last question I saw, someone was just asking, since you kind of skipped over the install piece, uh, you know, what sort of dependencies they should know about and, and you know, what, what is that process like at a high level? So, do you still there? 
Okay, uh, must be something wrong with the audio. We will. I can see you asked that question, so I will. I will get the uh, response and follow up with you. But um, it was the last question. So thanks everybody for for participating. Uh, Want to thank Soam for for presenting so much uh, detail here. And as I said, we uh, will share the slides and the recording in the next day or two. This should get up pretty soon. Uh, and and if there's any follow on questions after that, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I can connect you with some or uh, just just hop into the Fission Slack, as he says, or or, or Twitter. They're, they're pretty responsive. Thanks, everyone.